Hi everyone. Um, my name is Anna Brodsky and I'm going to talk to you all a little bit about the Global Redesign Institute, or as I will sometimes be referring to it across this presentation, the Global Redesign Initiative. So the majority of humankind doesn't really look backwards or forwards with the kind of technical analytical perspective which would really be necessary to meaningfully interpret or predict trends. We tend to look backwards uh, only with wistful nostalgia and forwards, as our previous speaker Adam touched on, mostly through an equally confounding haze of fear. Uh, so these vulnerabilities are of course exploited and amplified by mass media. And the result of that is um, a sustained state of looped, impulsive behavior. And in this mode, any future will be one which we sleepwalk into. But we're among friends here, aren't we? So let's leave this baggage at the door, at least for the moment, and slip into a more comfortable and refreshed perspective. So the Global Redesign Initiative is a transitional idea to not only show people what's possible, but to also get them excited and creatively involved in imagining our future. So this uh, is a very clear model for a systems approach to design, uh, production, distribution, and recycling. The idea here is that each stage encompasses a series of um, sustainability and efficiency protocols. So, for example, the, the design stage of a product, um, at the design stage of a product, will already determine how to pre-optimize the various components of the product for reuse or reincorporation after the product is avoided. So, in a global operating system with sound protocols, a zero waste, true economy, what sort of changes can we expect? My question is, what kind of future can we imagine? What will become of the things we love? How will they change? Well, let's put it into practice with a group thought experiment. I'd like you all to take a moment to take something, like an organization or a place, that you love and cherish about your community. Do you all have one? Yeah, okay, great. Now I am going to pick somebody completely at random, totally not someone I already know, definitely not a plant, <laughs> you there. <laughs> In the, uh, the boyish good looks. What? Uh, cafe. Cafe, okay, great. Uh, so what would this look like in a post-scarcity reality? How much would it change? It would change a lot. <laughs> um, so we're going to, for the sake of brevity, we're really only going to look at infrastructure, specifically the design, the sourcing of resources, and finally, human labor. In a post-scarcity scenario with dramatically decreased income inequality, innovation should thrive in a way which it simply can't under free market fundamentalism. I remind you all that the Greek origin of the word economy literally means household management. And true, functionally efficient household management really occurs when we are managing and hopefully preserving the house in its entirety. So bearing in mind that true cybernated um, economics should allow for a much higher degree of innovation, let's consider the design. Do you just love the fact that your favorite cafe has been cobbled together by a couple of uh, drunken old men in like the 1950s? Is that part of what lends it its rustic charm? Is that something like the bacon in your burger which you just couldn't imagine living without? Would you be willing to sacrifice these things which you have learned to love and tell yourself you love 
in favor of what's functional. Upon birth, we are spat into the fabric of our society. Do you, like so many among us, who are surviving the trauma of developing along the pattern of systemic inequality and structural violence, find it difficult to gauge when and where it's appropriate to compromise? Of course, boundaries are important. And a problem that people have when we bring up the Global Redesign Institute is that they instantly feel belittled. And there's this fear I've noticed when talking about this with people that our autonomy is going to dwindle when actually the opposite is far more likely. A true economy should facilitate our riskier enterprises, but in a safer way. So I refer you to um, the Venus Project's concept of an intelligent city. And you see, you know, we have these belts, industrial, agricultural, and the residential belts. You can also factor in an area especially designated for experimental, risky enterprises and activities. Uh, and here is where you could go on to uh, is where you could go to take on some riskier projects, but importantly, not at the expense of other people's safety. So what I'm saying is, old ladies and their grandsons would be able to opt out of having to contend with your mad, structurally experimental creative vision on their way to the park. And so this, this leaves room for a risk and for pleasure. And as important as that is, please remember that when designing a system, we lay the foundations for that system by breaking things down until we reach the irreducible minimum, the most essential styles, the bare bones. So resources. With companies around the world competing to undercut each other in exporting their resources to primarily Western countries and generating disgusting amounts of waste and human suffering in the process, we have this ridiculous situation where fresh produce is air freighted thousands of miles around the globe. 76% of apples consumed in the UK come from overseas whereas the typical exporter of tomatoes is Saudi Arabia. That means that they have to fly 3,100 miles to get to my supermarket in Ireland, tomatoes. Ugh, it's grotesquely inefficient. And it's something that we should expect to change. And it reminds of the Stoic philosophy, you know, this concept of wanting a fig in winter. Sometimes things are not available to us. And sometimes they are. But, for example, if something you love about this cafe of yours is that, I don't know, the table, it's got this table made from ivory and, uh, or maybe this gorgeous countertop made of some very rare wood that has been exported from halfway around the globe. Well, that kind of, that kind of indulgent way of thinking is unsustainable. Bless you and impractical, and, and it's, it's part of what keeps us where we are. Trust ourselves. Learn to love the system which loves us, rather than the one which simply panders to our dystopian pleasures while it erodes our biopsychosocial and environmental integrity. It's important we know ourselves and are honest with ourselves about our destructive preferences. For acknowledging our limitations is one of the first and really one of the most essential steps towards transcending them. And it may well be hard, similar to how it's hard to put down your phone and go for a jog. I've spoken with addicts who have mistreated themselves for so long that to do anything different feels not just sort of counterintuitive, but really profoundly out of character. And adopting new and healthy behaviors, it can be really challenging and uncomfortable. And at this point, we have to ask ourselves what matters. Now, with sound uh, infrastructure in place, human labor is designed out 
And of course, you'd still have the option to curate the indoor picnic space that your cafe may well become. But at this point, we run up against something that we have run up against time and time again, but it, it deserves acknowledging again. But I love my job. It's my vocation. I don't just work some bullshit job that I, that I hate so I can buy stuff that I don't need to impress people I don't like. I am a teacher. I am, I am a doctor. And I, like so many of us in this room and around the world, source my sense of self from how much others depend on me. I recently, um, I recently underwent surgery, nothing major, but I was on bed rest for a while. And in that time, I wanted to not just go outside and partake in the many and varied activities that you know, are good for my health, um, but I wanted to clean my house, and I wanted to make dinner for my family, and engage with and teach my daughter. And I couldn't. I had to stay in bed. And, uh, and I learned a valuable lesson. Life goes on. My mother uh, came down, and my partner cleaned the house, and cook the food, and my daughter had a meaningful and stimulating experience of life in my absence while I was resting. Life goes on. Sometimes, sometimes we have to take breaks. We have to step back and do what's healthy for us as individuals or as a society. And this, this doesn't make our contribution any less valid but it does mean that the functioning integrity of the system that we, that we care about and love, be it the immediate household or the global economy, should not be dependent on it. Uh, that's how it should be. You know, that's a sustainable way. And this gives us time to, to care for ourselves, to rest when we need to rest. What I'm describing to you is a thought process that we can all be involved in. And in doing so, we shed the fear of the future by engaging creatively with it. So the concept for the Global Redesign Institute is essentially to take this thought process and put it into a database. A globally accessible database into which we can input data on uh, city planning, product engineering, institution making, uh, and a Wikipedia-style approach to peer-to-peer -peer editing has been suggested. Um, I'm just going to throw this out there. I suggest uh, A, B, C, D board, 4chan style. Uh, how many of us here are familiar with 4chan? Yeah, yeah, I, I know. Um, um, wherein the most popular ideas are on A, the less popular on B, the more wacky and out there suggestions are relegated to D so on and so forth, you get it. Um, the point that I'm trying to make here, uh, not being a, you know, a, a web designer, an engineer myself, is that the stuff that goes on D is still accessible. Everything is accessible. It's all there to visit and to draw inspiration from and to comment on. And so in this way, somebody with a, with a very compelling vision for the future or idea, or creative idea for the future, but lacking the programming ability to express this in like in a technically technically cogent way. Uh, well, their ideas would still be there for someone with that ability to to draw inspiration from, and the same would be true vice versa. Once we input this sort of mentality into a global database, what we have is a machine for global redesign. So, for example, we would input what we want to create, and by employing this codified thought process, the optimum way to create this thing would be calculated. Now, more than anything, this is a call to, pen a call to pencils for engineers, technicians, and designers around the world. We can make this on a global scale. The entire Earth mapped out on this peer-to-peer -peer style database. 
For this to happen on this scale, we would need it to be custom coded by a core team of programmers. I liken this to a gentle machine because sentimentality, when left unchecked or worse, steroidified by mass media, is not an adequate vehicle for an engineer. But it isn't wise to deny our sentimentality either. Share the things that we care about. Review them, edit and create with them together. We all have vulnerabilities. These are our points of connection. And when we connect with our fellow fragile humans, we can form something great and strong. We form a community. Thank you.